Hi, welcome to uh, another edition of Political Science Fun Time. Uh, this video is for Sacramento State and uh, Folsom Lake College and anywhere else where I may end up teaching. This is uh, one of the last videos in our California politics sequence. Um, and I'm titling it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Rise of the Mods, kind of like Rise of the Machines from Terminator. Uh, because in this video, I'm going to explain to you one uh, pretty common model of voting behavior. It's just one. Remember, we also like the funnel of causality. So, you know, there's lots of different ways of looking at voting behavior, but it's a slightly different model than the funnel of causality. Um, and we're going to apply it to a bunch of different types of elections and see what happens. Um, it's an interesting, fun exercise. Make sure you're taking notes. Um, I will try to indicate to you where it's really important to be taking notes. Um, this is also the second lecture in this particular series of lectures. Um, it may end up being the third by the time everything's all done actually. So second, maybe third lecture, but this one's ready to go and it's ready for some students this semester that I wanna get it to. So rise of the mods. What we've seen is a rise of moderate legislate, legislators. Okay. So remember, rules matter, right? That's the that's so much the number one thing that I've been trying to tell you um, in this course is that rules matter. California has undergone some big changes in its system of governance for the last 15 years. Those changes have been largely the subject of the California Politics Unit, as well as other changes maybe we ought to make. Um, and I'll be looking at them again today in this lecture. I already did part one of this lecture, like I said, and there may end up being, well, the, the pre part one is really kind of like the end of the federal stuff. So I guess I can keep, call it part two, that's fine. Um, and this is what we're gonna do today. We're gonna, I'm gonna set up um, a voting model and then uh, um, uh, in fact, oh, set up a voting model and then um, uh, apply it for us. So uh, introduce, it's just a model, okay? Oh, this thing is really sensitive. Oh, there it is. So this is part two of the lecture, rise of the mods using a for formal model to make claims about elite, elite and mass voting behavior in the golden state. They're just predictions, not absolutes. It's just a model, it should be lowercase, introducing the median voter theorem. Okay, so we call it the median voter theorem. Write that down nice and big in your notes. Median voter theorem, it's just a model. Um, the median voter theorem comes from rational actor approaches to thinking about political behavior. So all of our institutionalist stuff, rules matter. Remember, like, I'm just still hammering on this, hammering on this, hammering on this, but it's really good for you to keep that in mind. It's not perfect, but it explains a lot. There are supplementary, supplementary materials in the Canvas module, especially the reading for this week. So you can kind of go a little bit deeper in the reading, but this video as always really gives you the vast majority of what you need. Um, we'll talk about some of its basic assumptions and things, but the very first thing we need to do is, I need to explain to you what is the median. If you think back to some of your intro math stuff from like a long time ago, there's three types of average, mean, median, and mode. Um, the mean is the one you're most used to. It's the number of things divided by, or the total divided by the number of things. The mode are, is like the most common number. So if one, one number appears five times, the rest of them only appear once or twice, that whatever that number that appeared five times would be your mode. And the median is your middle number. So if we put the class from tallest to shortest, Whoever was right in the middle would be the median. That's the median, whoever's right in the middle. It doesn't matter if someone's super short, someone else super tall, or how all those average heights work out. All that matters is whoever's in the middle. So what are the main assumptions of the median voter theorem? Uh, the first is the majoritarian assumption. Uh, the most important assumption of the median voter theorem is that the median actually is the winning voter. Uh, this does not happen all the time. Just think about the US Senate where it usually takes 60 votes to do something. Second, because of the majoritarian assumption, the median voter therefore argues that 
politicians will position take remember we did that last week and run and run their campaigns to get a majority of votes the median voter is the guy who will put you over the top therefore candidates will appeal to that guy or gal so basically politicians will say anything to get elected but it's what they're saying is what the median voter wants because that's going to get them over the top so I'm filling in some gaps here, a little more on the main assumptions of the median voter theorem. Um, just like all our other rational actor stuff, we have voters and candidates that are strategically preference maximizing. They want to maximize their policy outcome or their policy utility. Also, ideology, we're saying here, we're assuming it's, it's best understood on a one-way scale. In other classes of mine, I show you how you can do an X, Y axis, which is linear algebra with, um, and with, with um, ideology and lots of people, you can model it that way too and things get a lot more complicated. But um, the left, right, 1D scale, one dimension scale is plenty good enough for what we're doing here. Um, but you know there are some limitations to it. You wanna keep that in mind. Because of these two, things that we've now stipulated, uh, voters uh, will pick candidates closer to them on the 1D scale, regardless of other questions. All voters care about is who's telling them what they wanna hear. If they have concerns about trustworthiness or character or affairs on your wife, or do you go to church or whatever, those things, are, they're not, they don't independently matter. <laughs> according to how the median voter theorem is thinking, which of course that's not true. I mean, like it's, you know, it's, you know, just not true. These things do matter, but we're just not gonna worry about them for the sake of clarity basically. Um, and it kind of mucks with our assumptions a little bit. Similarly, the theory goes that party identification does not matter. Although again, if you recall, partisanship is super high. Party ID does matter but we'll see some cases, but not always. And so, you know, that's a little bit of a problem, but it doesn't completely jankify what the MVT, MVT, MVT median voter theorem. So when I say MVT, that's median voter theorem, you know, and lots of other things don't matter either. We're just looking at strategically voting uh, voters who are picking candidates that are telling them what they wanna hear and candidates that are telling voters what they wanna hear as well. So um, we're gonna, let's just look at a most simple example of the median voter theorem, just looking at a general election. Um, and, uh, but that is P-L-E-C-T-I-O-N in a general election, uh, where most voters really kind of like are moderate, um, at least historically speaking, I mean, with polarization, you know, it, that polarization is having a whole other effect here, right? But um, the median voter theorem will cause politicians to come to the middle, right? This is the whole idea here. In a general election, everyone's voting. You got to get 50% plus one. Everyone's going to appeal to mid middle. Um, bam, here's a nice little chart for us, right? So where, where liberals and conservatives are relatively balanced, someone in the middle, candidates from both sides are gonna come in and try to get that person. Um, the general election scenario, this is, we'll call this our first case. So what I actually like you to do is now go back here and write case number one, general election and draw this chart real quick, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect. I don't care about it being perfect, but like case number one, general election, right? Most of the voters are in the middle, maybe label that as well split basically 50 50 liberal and conservative the median's right there in the middle everything's like fine and dandy and isn't that great we get some moderation give you a second here to do that okay um so this is our first case right uh there's lots more okay i'm just really starting a slow um, and they get really interesting as we keep going. So that's just like your su super basic intro. Um, but you know, follow along in your notes, draw the diagrams in your notes. They're really important. They're super helpful for thinking about this um, uh, uh, 
uh, this thing. Um, and again, they don't have to be perfect. Make sure you have median equals middle number in your notes somewhere. That's really important, as well as median middle voter cast the deciding vote. Therefore, politicians will appeal to his slash her preference. Okay. I'll give you a second, make sure you get all of that in there. Okay, so um, let's look at our second case. And this one's really quite humorous. And there's a great link online to a hilarious SNL episode um, that um, I strongly encourage you to, to watch. Um, uh, it's, it's so funny. And it, it perfectly explains what I'm about to explain to you here. Um, but what I call party primary elections are ones that you usually think of when you think about a primary, right? an election internal to whatever political party at hand, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian. You know, we have third parties in the US, they just don't win, right? Remember that. To select, and so that party, you have a party, they have an election just for them, um, and they get to select who they want to run for office, and then those candidates run against each other. Um, in this case, however, What's really happening, case number two, is we're looking at several independent elections. You're looking at one election where Democrats are voting for Democrats and a different election where Republicans vote for Republicans. Now, because this is happening, therefore the median Democratic voter is not gonna be right in the middle of the entire political spectrum, it's gonna be in the middle of the Democratic spectrum and vice versa for Republicans, okay? So now you're gonna have can't you're gonna have two elections, but they're gonna be kind of far apart, somewhat like this. Um, uh, my dog just grabbed something. Um, uh, as the median Democratic voter is further to the left than the median American voter, and vice versa, Republicans, the median voter theorem causes candidates or argues that candidates will therefore go out to the extremes. It's not that the MVT does it, it's that um, they think that's what it causes. So um, we're calling this a bimodal distribution. Notice how it looks much different. When we separate Democrats and Republicans, now our medians are far apart. And if you overlay this with the one from earlier, you can see what's going on here, right? So in the primary elections, candidates are pulled out to the extremes. And then in the general election, they turn around and try to race back to the center. We see this in presidential elections a lot, okay? So um, honestly, this could apply to pretty much any presidential election in the United States. Um, it explains why candidates go to more to the extreme uh, political spectrum in the primaries and then turn around and have to race back to the middle in a general election. The median voter in the primary is further outside, right? Just keep this in mind. And this applies to both federal and state elections, but we see it most clearly in presidential elections. And if you're paying attention to 2016, this is largely what happened to Hillary Clinton. Um, there's other reasons I think she lost that election. This didn't help. This you know, probably is one of them, but there's maybe 10 sort of reasons that she lost the election. Um, Really funny SNL skit, strongly recommend that you watch it. Okay, so case one, general election, go the middle. Case two, primary election, go the outside. So in real life, we do primaries first. So you go the outside and then you go, and then in the general, you turn around and race back to the middle. Now, what happens, however, take a general election and um, it's not pretty balanced between Democrats and conservatives. What if we're gerrymandering and we're packing districts so that one side has a strong registration advantage? What happens? Well, our median is no longer going to be in the middle of the whole American voter. It's going to be moving left and right, depending how we pack our districts. Um, so remember, gerrymandering is drawing electoral districts to favor an ethnic group or political party. Um, it comes from uh, Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Jerry. Um, uh, in California, what we used to do in the past, this is our old rule, the way things used to work, is we drew districts to favor incumbents, whatever party they were. 
So Democrats and Republicans would get, get around a table and Democrats would say to Republicans, hey, Republicans, I really like to have Democrats in my district. How does that sound to you? And Republicans would say, well, it doesn't sound bad to me because I like having Republicans in my districts. So what we were doing, so you see, that's an easy trade for the political parties to, to hash out. You take all the Republicans, we'll take all the Democrats, Democrats get Democrats, Republicans get Republicans, everyone gets an easy reelection. And even if there's other problems, you know, that means your reelection is a lot more secure. So that's a nice thing not to have to worry about. Um, uh, so in this case, though, with if the median, if we're packing districts to have more to have registration advantage one way or another, that means the median is going to be moving with that person. And the further away, the more the median gets into um, the, the party ideology, whether left or right, the more it starts to look actually kind of like a primary election where you're moving out to the outsides, trying to capture a median voter who's now being pushed sort of like left or right. Um, and then candidates will position take for that as well. So what we're seeing here is we're actually seeing a rise in ideological extremity and a rise in polarization amongst candidates. And so here's what a chart would look like, right? If you move, if you give Republicans just a one point registration advantage, the odds of winning jump almost to 60% and vice versa for Democrats. So just a 1% registration advantage has a huge effect on actual electability. You go to 2% and it's fully two thirds. So it goes from six out of 10 to two thirds. I mean, these are lit big moves in, in electoral probability and probability of winning. And it doesn't take a lot of packing to do that. Um, so in a condition in which Democrats and Republicans are packing, now we're seeing the medians move apart and the candidates go with them. And then more, pars more partisanship, more polarization in the, um, uh, in the legislature as well. Um, so this was a genuine issue, right? And this is a nationwide issue. We've looked at it before in class. California did something about it. Uh, Prop 11 in 2010, the Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 2010. Um, and, you know, like I said, one of the results was a lot of partisan gridlock in Sacramento, exactly because the candidates were moving further apart and you have packed districts and that's what happens. So the citizens, this was actually Arnold Schwarzenegger's idea. The Citizens uh, Redistricting Commission mandated more competitive districts, but there are other legal limits. You can't make, and California has such a, just naturally is more of a democratic state. So it would literally be impossible to make every district like perfectly competitive. That's not gonna happen. But where possible, there's a search for competitive districts. So maybe one out of four or so is pretty, pretty competitive, but that's good. That creates a good middle ground there of whether you're Democrat or Republican, you are gonna to have to appeal to that sort of statewide median and you're gonna to have to sort of sit there and try to be a little more moderate. So and I would say it's probably about 20, 25%. That feels about right to me as far as how many districts are really sort of in this sort of very median competitive space and good, great. I mean, like it's, that helps bring the parties together because now there literally is a middle ground sitting there in the California state legislature. Um, so this has definitely led to more compromise in the legislature. It's been part of the rise of the mods, right? You're gonna get more moderates where you have competitive districts. Most of the research suggests that this is significantly, uh, moderately too significantly. I don't wanna overplay the research, but clearly this is having an effect. 100% certain about that. It's hard to disentangle the effects of all the rule changes when they happen so quickly. Okay, take a breath. I just covered a lot. How long? I'm not sure how long this video is going, but it's it's not too bad. It's going to be about 40, 45 minutes. Okay. The final change that we're going to look at, so take a breath. The final change we're going to look at, and it gets two, it gets two of its own unique cases when using the median voter theorem, is the switch also at the same time as redistricting to the open or jungle primary. Okay. So remember, I just talked about the second case was a traditional party primary, right? This is different than that. An open primary is 
all the candidates go into one big field and they all run against each other in a primary election, anyone can vote for anyone. Democrats can vote for Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or Green and same with Republicans, Libertarian, Green. You vote for whoever you want. And then whoever the top two go to the go into the general uh, election to face each other. So it could be two Democrats, it could be two Republicans or one of each. And we do see two Democrats quite frequently and not quite as frequently, but pretty common to Republicans as well. OK, so happens quite, you know, relatively, relatively frequently to see two Republicans as well. So. Um, this has a strong effect as well, um, both on the primary and the general. So let's look first at the primary. That would be case number four. And then we'll look at the general election and see how it plays out. Again, just to return to though, so different types, right? Rules matter. So let's like return and clarify the two types of primary elections really cleanly in our head. So old rule in California, old rule was parties do primaries, okay? just like a US presidential election. There's a small distinction here between open and closed. We're not gonna worry about that. Usually what ends up happening, uh, always what ends up happening is you have a Republican and a Democrat in the general election. You also have Green Party, Libertarian, et cetera. They're just not gonna win. The viable candidates will be one Republican and one Democrat. And single member districts are largely responsible for um, the two party system. And so that's what happens. You have primaries. There's only two viable parties. Those candidates go to the general election and then whoever wins, wins. OK, just like a U.S. presidential election, the Green Party has, you know, they have uh, uh, candidates and they have an internal debate and a vote. And so the libertarians and all of that for presidential elections, but not um, not um, but they're just not going to win. OK. That's the old rule. And most states still do it that way. The new rule, top two primary. Everyone, like I just said, but I'm just doing it again because to like get it clear in your head. Everyone in one election altogether, they're not doing a separate election for Democrats and a separate election for Republicans. Everyone altogether, whoever the top two vote earners are, they go to the general election. It's almost all, it's, you know, one Republican, one Democrat, that's one case, two Republicans, two Democrats, and every once in a while, not super frequently, but you will have a Democrat or a Republican versus an independent. So sometimes there's marginally greater chance for third parties to compete in the top two system. It's pretty marginal, but it's there. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so this is the median. So um, let's look at how now with the top two primary locked in our brain, how the median voter theorem applies. Well, interestingly, like remember, usually in party primaries, you appeal to the base, so you end up kind of going outside. But in a situation where there's a bunch of candidates, multiple Democrats, multiple Republicans, a Green Party, a Libertarian, there's going to be like all kinds of candidates here running. In this, and when they get thrown together here, there's frequently five to seven or more parties competing. This really changes how they behave, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> and more interesting, in a situation where Democrats and Republicans, especially multiple ones, are running against each other all at the same time, the median voter theorem actually doesn't work. It, completely, it can't comprehend what's happening here, okay? But we're gonna take a look at it because it's still really interesting. And we're gonna see how just kind of like slightly modifying the median voter theorem can sort of help us out. Um, so let's take a look. Um, but let's return to this first. Um, that's right, the median voter theorem is not actually explaining what's going on here, why? Because um, with so many candidates crowding the field, voters don't have a clear choice between option one and option two, who will find it advantageous to go into the middle, okay? Rather, um, two, not one candidate will move on. Also, in addition to that, sorry, two candidates, not just one, will move on from the primary into the general election. That means you don't need a majority. With two winners, you don't need to have a majority, right? You only need to have what? More than a third, okay? So 34% will get you in. If there's three candidates, 34% will get you in to the general election every time, 
okay? As long as there's three candidates. Um, uh, um, you know, it could be 49, you know, uh, could, well, it could be 35, 35, 30, 35, 35, 30, or whatever, that, or 34, 34, 32, right? It could be really close, or it could be much different. Could be, you know, it could be 55%, 2%, 10%, oh, that doesn't, it doesn't matter. Numbers, the numbers, exact numbers don't matter, but just gotta be number two, you'll make it through. So there you go. Um, what this means in turn, is that candidates aren't looking to get to the median at this point. They will later when they need to get majoritarianism, but they're not there yet. Rather, what they do is they try to appeal to pools of voters. Here's a bunch of environmentalists, or here's religious conservatives, or here's like the labor folks, or here's like Latinos, or whatever, right? Whatever it is, big business, you know, Dems, like whatever sort of commonly appearing pool of voters they're gonna to try to appeal to them and ride that sort of solid group, ride that group into the um, general election. Frequently, uh, two Democrats, and it's interesting because the numbers do kind of add up funny here. Sometimes you see two Democrats split the vote, like 30, like, well, maybe something like 30%, 25% and the Republican gets like 35% or something or even more. But then the Democrat who had less primary votes than the Republican comes through and wins. And that happens exactly because um, that happens exactly because um, all the Democrats just go, you know, they go from one Democrat to the other Democrat. So, and so what, what kind of action then do we see in the primary? And this is where things get really interesting. Okay, so first, like I just described, candidates try to sit. They try to sit on a pool of voters. So like, I'm going to be the labor guy. And they try to sit there and be the labor guy. Take those voters and maybe get a few others kind of near them that they can cobble together to get to 34, 35, 36%. Okay. Um, second, if there's other candidates near them, they might try to like knock them out. So they could try to like dig up dirt on each other. Oh, I have photos that like, you know, you're having an affair in your wife. If you don't drop out of the race, I'm gonna to go to the newspaper or, you know, that's like a kind of the mean way to do it, but like, I'm sure that happens. Or, um, hey, drop out, I'll cruise to victory and then I'll point you to something. And like, that probably happens too. And like, this is all quid pro quo or blackmail. You're not supposed to do these things, but certainly they're happening, okay? So that's sit, sit on a pool of voters. Two, knock out, knock out people close to you. Anyone who's close to you, you wanna knock them out so that their voters, will come to you, right? Because you're voting for whoever's closest to you. So their voters will come to you. But then third, if you, especially if you see a strong candidate who's on the other side, a Republican or a Democrat, and you don't want to run against that strong candidate, you might try to recruit someone else to come jump in and jump in on that candidate's space to split their vote, okay? So you want to knock out candidates close to you so your pool can expand but where other people are strong candidates, you want to parachute other candidates close to them to start sucking at their base to try to keep them from making it into the general election. Does that sound like a whole bunch of strategery and manipulation? Yeah, I mean, it really is. Um, um, and some nefarious things happen. So we've seen uh, candidates recruit people to jump in. They like change their party registration. And they, the only reason why they jump in is because they share the same last name as a very strong candidate. And they're doing that literally just trying to confuse voters so that voters don't know, you know, they're not sure who to vote for, that vote gets split and then the Republican or Democrat makes it through, right? So we're seeing that. And it looks like this. So I don't have the fancy, um, I thought I had this one on fancy slide, but I don't, so I'll have to redo it. But um, this is all of the, the voters sitting, right? Look here, this is all the voters sitting, A, B, uh, the candidate sitting A, B, C, D, E, right? And then B or A is trying to, there we go. So like A will try to knock out B or B will try to knock out A, right? And notice they're like overlapping a little bit. Or, you know, uh, C will try to get someone to jump in right here or right here in order to expand their, in order to hurt the other people and therefore it, it increase their ability to, um, uh, to get through to the general election.
Okay, so that's that's case number four, right? Case number four is sit is primary elections in top two elections. Median voter theorem doesn't fully hold, but the candidates will sit, jump in, and knock out. Okay. And then case five, this is our last case. We're almost there, guys. But what happens if you do have two parties of the same, uh, two candidates of the same party in the general election? Well, it turns out that there's a really strong advantage for the more moderate candidate. So here, this is would be, this example would be two Democrats. This is case five, medium voter theorem in general election with two candidates from the same party. So our fifth case, so two Democrats made it through to the general election together. This is just the Democratic spectrum. It doesn't have the Republican spectrum in it. But so this, this center Democrat, he's not as popular amongst all the Democrats, but who are the Republicans gonna vote for? Well, they're much, much, much more likely to vote for this guy, right? And it turns out that some Republicans just don't, I mean, or Democrats are winning the shoes on the other foot. If you don't have someone of your party preference, some people just don't vote. Decent amount, 10, 15% of people literally just say like, forget it, I don't care. Um, but a large percent of them, some of them cast votes for, you know, uh, write in or something like that. But a large percent of them actually do go vote for whatever Democrat seems a little more moderate to them. Because they, you know, and that's definitely, you know, it's better to have someone you kind of dislike than someone you really dislike. And like, makes sense right so um so that's what you get you get a really strong advantage for a more moderate a more centrist candidate when you have two candidates of the same party now it doesn't always happen it definitely does not always ha happen where the more centrist candidate wins um you know there's many of the some of the things that the model's not accounting for frequently lead to uh more extreme candidates winning so, um, uh, you know, there have been, you know, there's lots of cases where this happens, um, uh, you know, but like still, this effect is almost certainly stronger than the effect we saw from the Citizens Redistricting Commission. So I would say um, probably the majority of the time, the more moderate candidate wins. So I think the, the model's capturing a lot of real world behavior. I would say probably something like two thirds of the time, the um, more moderate candidate wins, but I don't really have the numbers on that. In the reading, I have an interesting diagram for you that would show about, about that as well. Um, so big, big advantage for the more moderates. Okay, so here we go. We're at the end, rise of the mods, right? Look at what has happened. The previous rule changes we looked at, term limits, just better, more professional legislatures, which is good, which actually increases moderation. The budget thing, which, you know, it just made things go a lot easier. So not really increasing moderation, but it really increased, uh, you know, flow and efficiency and stuff like that. But now we have Citizens Redistricting Commission, which has a strong effect on moderation, moderate to strong effect on moderation and the top, top two primary, which has almost certainly a stronger effect, a stronger moderating effect than even the Citizens Redistricting Commission. So you've got multiple rule changes. They're all working together to create a much more moderate democratic um, uh, set of legislatures, le legislators in Sacramento. They're not all moderate, but now in Sacramento, pretty much the way things work is you have progressive Dems, the lefty Dems, you have moderate Dems and you have Republicans. And um, I would say, you know, it's almost like one third, one third, one third. Republicans are a little under a third. Um, so a lot of the negotiating that's happening is between moderates, moderate Dems and more progressive Dems. But um, we are seeing ability for uh, moderates to work with Republicans, which is really nice. I think that's good. I think some important work is happening there. Um, you know, there you go. Okay, um, so, um, uh, so, you know, today, look, if anything, some people, more of the Democratic Party types, you just want to do Democratic, you know, tax and spend types, um, 
you know, they think we've gone too far towards the middle. I leave that up to you. I don't really care if you think we've gone too far towards the middle. Most people like moderation. I do too. However, I would say there's a caveat. Um, the answer is not always right in the middle. Sometimes it really is further one way or the other. And so all things in moderation, including moderation, uh, but there's no doubt that you know, the more moderate strain in elected representatives in Sacramento, I think has been good for the state over the last 15 years, right? So I'm not one of these guys, like some people just like sell out to moderation, it's just like moderation at all costs. And like, that doesn't make sense either. But for where California was, it did make a lot of sense. It's made a big difference. It's nice. Um, and then again, when you add up those other, those other things, we're seeing a real rise of the mods or rise of the machines <laughs> or maybe <laughs> the rise of the machines has begun battery level two percent <laughs> or maybe what if i told you the rise of the machines was meant as a horror scenario that's for you hard dems who like you know rise of the mods is a horror scenario it's terrible um uh I just went down the meme hole. Uh, step one, beat human at connect four. Step two, enslave all of humanity. And then that's a video that I'm never going to do. So that's the end. We'll stop recording there. Um, thank you for uh, watching. <laughs>